This sculptural masterpiece comes from ancient Egypt's Old Kingdom and is some 4,500 years old. The statue shows the Egyptian king Menkare, also known as Menkara or Mycerinus, in stride beside a woman, also in stride, who is almost equal in height to the king. Her right hand grasps the king just above his waist, and her left rests on his upper arm. The dyad is 139 centimeters high, about 4 feet 7 inches. A slab on the back reaches to the figure's shoulders, so their bodies are carved about three quarters of the way around, but the heads, wholly so. There are important features that were left unfinished. For example, there are no striations on the woman's wig and king's nemes headdress, which we would normally expect, and no pleating on the king's kilt. The base was never inscribed, and only the upper portion of the statue was polished. All of this suggests that the statue was hastily put into use, maybe because of Menkare's sudden death. In this period of Egypt's history, statuary was considered to have great power. They were believed to be repositories for the Ka, that is, the animating life force of gods, kings, and humans. This was important for humans in particular after death. The Ka of an individual could inhabit any number of statues at the same time. While the statues were considered powerful, vitally important, and even dangerous, they also were mostly secluded. That is because they needed protection from the elements and from damage caused by people. They also were dependent on ritual treatment for survival. Statues representing the king received particularly complex rituals, so they did need to be accessible to the officiating priests. Old Kingdom royal temples housed large numbers of statues. The Valley Temple of Mankare at Giza would also have contained many statues, but it was never finished. Nevertheless, some of the statues, including this one, were stored in it anyway. I wanted to learn more about this fascinating work, so I contacted Lawrence Berman from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, the current home of the statue, to see what he could tell me. I will share that conversation with you now, and after that, I will reveal a few more interesting facts about the statue that you may not know, so stick around to the end. I have with me here Dr. Lawrence Berman. Uh, he's an Egyptologist and the Senior Curator of Ancient Egyptian, Nubian, and Near Eastern Art at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And uh, he's here to talk with us today about that wonderful statue of Menkara and his wife. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Dr. Berman. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. All right. Uh, so let's start out uh, talking about uh, how this object was found. Who found it? When did they find it? Uh, can you give us some inf information about that? Right. The pair statue of Menkara and the Queen was found in January 1910 by the Harvard University Museum of Fine Arts expedition in Egypt, directed by George Reisner, a great archaeologist. Excellent. Uh, so uh, what, what was the context of its the find? Where, where you know, uh, what was it near? What where was it? Uh, what else was there around it? Well, it was found in a temple, and the temple was by the Third Pyramid, which belonged, was built by King Menkau Ra, and it's the smallest of the three pyramids at Giza, although it is by no means small. It's small compared to the immense size of the Great Pyramid and that slightly smaller Pyramid of uh, Khafra. And the pyramids themselves were the center of an entire complex that also involved temples dedicated to the worship of the king. So at the foot of the pyramid on its eastern side facing the Nile, there would be a temple that we call the pyramid temple or an upper temple. And that would be uh, full of uh, statues and uh, it would be occupied by priests serving the king. And then there would be a long causeway that would go down to in the direction of the Nile, where there would be another temple at the limits of the Nile flood. And that was called the Valley Temple or Lower Temple. I see. Because yeah. seasonally, the water would rise when the Nile was in flood. And so when the water was high, it would come to a certain point at the edge of the desert. And the Egyptians were very 
were ingenious in their use of the water. They would trap it and they use it for irrigation purposes, but they could also create harbors in which you could offload heavy stones, such as you would use to build the pyramid and, uh, and the statues that populated the temples associated with the pyramid. I see. And uh, as I understand it, there, there's nothing actually on the statue that identifies it as uh, the Pharaoh Menkara, right? But, um, but we know from the context that it's him? We know from the context and also because we, there, there are many portraits of King Menkara that are identified, so they have his name. The thing about the pear statue, it is universally admired and it is very, very beautiful so beautiful that most people looking at it casually don't realize that the statue was never completed. So when you look at the statue, you can see that the king's face was all complete and it even has traces of the original paint because even dark stone sculptures like this one were painted, if not completely painted, parts of it were. So if you look closely at the recesses in the ears or the nostrils, you'll see the remains of the brick red paint which was the normal color that men's skin was painted in ancient Egyptian art. As you go down, you see that the king's figure is uh, practically done and polished. The queen's figure less so. Her face is not as smoothly polished as the king's. Her toes are only roughed out. You can look at the base of it compared to the king's toes, where you see the nails and the cuticles are all there in their detail. The base of the statue was never polished and did not receive its inscription. We assume it had an inscription. Maybe it didn't, but most statues do. There is a pillar to which the figures are attached. It's integral to the statue. And that hasn't been polished either. The stone is a bit rough. If you come to our galleries, you can compare the pear statue with one of the triads uh, statues that have three people, the king, the goddess Hathor, and a personification of one of the provinces of Egypt whose wealth went to support the king's cult. And if you look at that one, that you'll see every single surface is polished smooth and all the inscriptions are neat and crisp. Wow. So you're, are you saying that they started painting it before they had finished polishing it? Apparently. Interesting, because you normally would think, oh, they first they do all the stonework and then they would uh, do the paint after they were done. Right, and of course we don't really know. I mean, something of the pyramid complex was not finished when the king died, apparently. So we don't know if they were in a hurry we don't know if they said, well, we've gotten this far, let's paint the king's face, we're ready for that. And then, you know, it's functional because the statue would be able to function in the cult for which it was made, even if it was not totally finished. Mm, I see. Uh, what is the statue made out of? The statue was made out of a stone called gray wacky. And it's a sedimentary stone. It uh, ranges in color from grayish, to gray to green. The pear statue of Menkara and Queen are more, more gray. The stone was much prized by the Egyptians from early to its history and uh, successively through the latest pharaonic periods. It's found in a specific quarry in the Eastern desert between the Nile and the Red Sea. So it's not found along the Nile like limestone or sandstone. It required a great effort to get it. You would have to outfit an expedition. You had to make sure that the expedition had food. You had to make sure that the expedition had an armed escort because there were, you don't know who you would meet there in the desert. And this was carried on at um, a, a, a great scale. The Egyptians were very choosy about the, the stones that they used and they didn't spare any effort to uh, get what they were looking for. And uh, those other statues that were with this particular statue are also made out of the same stone. Is that right? We have gray wacky statues of King Menkara. We also have Egyptian alabaster statues of King Menkara. Wow. So, and you said um, something to the effect that you can tell by looking at it that it is Menkara. Is, uh, is, is there something that differentiates him from other pharaohs when you look at it? Yes, his face. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so if you have four portraits of the same person in a room, and uh, three of them have labels, and the fourth one does not have a label but looks exactly like the other three, you can be pretty sure it represents right. the same person. I, I ask that because sometimes uh, people who are not familiar with a, a lot of the pharaohs and their imagery, you know, one pharaoh looks just like any other pharaoh. I mean, you could tell like Akhenaten or somebody like that, but some of them seem to have just very standard faces. But um, but there is there is an individualistic element to it, huh? For when I see them, and I think if you come to the MFA, you can look at portraits of pharaohs from different periods and, and see the difference. There are certain things about Egyptian art that are standard and which make it Egyptian art. It's like the grammar of a language, otherwise you don't understand it. But the faces don't all look the same. The facial features differ to a great degree. So you can tell Mankara, he has certain facial features. He tends to have uh, bulbous eyes and uh, a rounded nose and very full lips and particularly lower lips is uh, large and, 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 and voluptuous and, you can, and fleshy cheeks. There is a difference. Not all of his portraits look exactly alike because not the same sculptor necessarily is working on them. The way the king's features appear on the pear statue is a bit uh, leaner, a bit bonier. You see more salient cheekbones than on some other statues. You see the same features, but it, his face is maybe a little fleshier. So, so more than one artist produced the statues. Uh, statues were produced in tremendous numbers. In addition to the ones that have survived in good condition, we have uh, countless fragments of others that had been smashed. Mm, yeah. Until the work of our expedition in Egypt, there were very few likenesses that had survived of the pyramid builders. But of course, we were familiar with Egyptian art mainly through later periods. And the site of Giza in particular experienced a revival in the seventh and sixth centuries BC, which we call the late period. It was a period that's characterized by a research into the past. And when the first statues of Mankara appeared, and uh, the pear statue was found in 1909, but the triads I spoke about and other statuary from the Pyramid Temple were found in 1907, people weren't quite sure who it was. And there were some archaeologists who thought that they were late period copies, you know, and not originals of the fourth dynasty, because we didn't have originals of the fourth dynasty to compare it to. Or if we did have them, they were not recognized as such. Well, how'd they figure out that they were authentic? Well, successive discoveries that happened very, very fast. In no time, I mean, the first reaction, you know, of certain archaeologists was, oh, no, it's 26th dynasty, it's not 4th dynasty. But, you know, in a few months, everybody realized that, no, these are the authentic works of the original builders of the pyramid. But it's amazing because, you know, you, you can only, you can only bring to bear on, uh, in any argument, what you already know. And here were things being discovered for the first time, and it, uh, the information hadn't been processed yet. Yeah, wow. It amazes me to think too that you know these 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 icons of Egyptian art that we identify without any reservation as the faces of the pyramid buildings were at first not even recognized as such because we didn't have anything to compare it to. Even the Sphinx, which most people now would say this is an old kingdom king, people, people didn't know because yeah. there's no you know, contemporary inscriptions that tell you. Yeah. And uh, how would the artist have uh, carved this statue? Do you know what the process was exactly? Or Well, I, uh, the same way you would carve the statue today. It's a, you've got a person with chisels and stones. I mean, first you quarry the stone and, and you bring it to the studio or you work with it in the quarry. They had, uh, they had man-made tools, so they didn't have lasers, but they carved the statue the same way Michelangelo carved the statue. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, now, what is the significance of painting the skin red? It was a, 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 a convention in ancient Egyptian art that the skin of uh, men is generally reddish brown, brick red. The skin of uh, women is generally a, a yellowish color. Uh-huh, I see. 
Uh, all right. Uh, so you would would you call this particular artist one of the better ones uh, compared to some other Egyptian artists? There are people who think that it never got better than it did in the Pyramid Age. I think there are great periods of Egyptian sculpture throughout in the Middle Kingdom and in the New Kingdom and in the late period too. But this is one of the finest examples of Egyptian sculpture that exists anywhere. I see. Yeah, it is beautiful. And what Even purpose- Even though it is not finished. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Even though, yeah. Even though. Mm -hmm. And uh, what purpose did the, the statue serve? Why was it made in the first place? Well, the ancient Egyptians did not make statues just to admire them in museums. The statue was an active participant in the funerary cult or the cult, or the cult of the gods in ancient Egypt. The statues were literally brought to life in the course of a ceremony called opening the mouth in which uh, a specially certified priest would hold special implements to, uh, to, to open up the nose and the mouth and the eyes of the statue so that their senses would become functional. And the statue would then become a place that the spirit would manifest itself to receive offerings and participate in religious ceremonies and benefit by the offerings made to the gods. And in effect, the dead person, after having gone through the uh, proper funeral with all of the proper the rites carried out properly, was deified. I see. And uh, what, what is the reason why, why you think both of them are on this statue, both he and his wife? It's not so uncommon for there to be a statue of a man and a wife even a king and a queen. Very often the queen, however, is, is a, a subsidiary figure and is smaller in scale than the king, maybe is only knee high. The real striking thing is that here, the both figures are about the same height. He's a little taller, but they're about the same height. And so this means that their importance is about the same. If you look also at the queen, She's embracing him and she is supporting him. And so she's playing a role. And both the king and queen in their statuary are the embodiments of Egyptian deities. The king is the god Horus, who is a sun and sky god, but also a god of kingship. The queen is the goddess Hathor. And uh, she is a goddess of, of love, people say, but that's uh, that love, sexuality, motherhood. She was the great Egyptian goddess in the pyramid age. And she is presenting him. She is legitimizing him. As it, she is the mother of the king, it's a difficult concept. She is uh, also acting as a maternally to, per, to, to, to protect him and present him. In a way, it is making palpable, realizing in three dimensions, the spells that were recited at the royal funeral, which in later periods were carved in the pyramids, but in the fourth dynasty were not carved in the pyramids. And these so-called spells protect the king from danger in the afterlife, but also introduce him to the other gods and, uh, and proclaim him a member of the corporation of gods. Oh, yeah. Well, would this statue have ever been seen by anybody? Sure. It would have been seen by the priests whose job it was to perform the ceremonies at the statue. And, but, and probably not by many other people, only because of its location. Now, of course, I'm, I'm making believe I know what that location was. And I do not, because the temple was so destroyed that most of the statues were not found where they were originally placed. And the temple was never completed according to its original plan. So maybe the statue never was in its originally intended place. When the king died, his architects his, and the, 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 the builders had gotten as far as laying out and building the foundations of the temple in stone. But the superstructure, the building itself was completed in mud brick. And we don't know to what extent. Uh, the uh, mud brick completion adhered to the original design that was supposed to be in stone. Mm -hmm. And then 
we're talking about hundreds of years because the reign of Menkara, 2490 BC, you know, there's a lot of time between then and now. There's a, 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 a lot of Egyptian history was flourishing during that time. The temple went through various phases with the passage of time, a whole community moved into its courtyard, which established, you know, which afforded protection. The area reserved for the actual observance of the cult of the king shrank. So, uh, so, so after a few hundred years, the entire temple, the temple park, the part that was actually used for services was restricted maybe to the porch before the sanctuary. The stones, the statuary at some point or various points, it's hard to establish exactly when, you know, were, uh, were broken up. Certain ones were buried maybe for safety. This statue is flawless. The lower part of the king's beard was uh, broken and uh, the pieces were found and reattached, but otherwise it's, it's, it's in, it, is, it, is, it is totally intact and it had been buried in a hole. Wow. Carefully placed in a hole. Oh, carefully placed. Careful. Well, otherwise it would have been broken. You oh, know, yeah, yeah. It was standing on its own base. So it someone was trying to save it. it. You would think so. I mean, George Reisner, who was a brilliant archaeologist, he assumed it was Thebes, Thebes and he called this hole the Thebes hole. But um, maybe not. You know, why would the Thebes have... Uh, have uh, well, they wouldn't have been interested in the statue anyway. You can't recycle this sort of thing. The thieves are generally interested in precious substances that you can recycle and can't be specifically identified with its place of origin. You know, they might want to break up the statue and bring it so that the stone could be reshaped into smaller things like stone vessels. You know, that's possible, but still a lot of effort. But this was carefully placed. Also, there were a number of, of uh, statues showing the king with the goddess Hathor and uh, personification of a, of a province, the so-called triads. And uh, four of those were found buried and completely perfect. But many others were found smashed. Oh. So it's, uh, it's uh, you don't know. It's, uh, it's hard to put yourself exactly back then. I mean, you can try, but you might be wrong. You know, to, to reconstruct exactly what, what happened. But it does seem that some of these statues were carefully placed away for their protection. Interesting. I, I'm picturing like some, some invaders coming and attacking and someone's like, I don't want this to get destroyed, so I'm going to bury it or something like that. You know? Yeah, or they were planning on coming back for it later. Who knows? Right. And also, these statues are not so easy to move. So it's not something you can do so quickly. Uh, how, how heavy is this particular statue? Oh, like, I, I mean, ballpark. To, I would have to look that up. Oh, okay, I, all right. <laughs> yes. would have to but it isn't light, up. is what you're saying. It's a nearly, it's, 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 a, no, it's a life size stone, hard stone sculpture. It's hard to move, even harder to move safely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the statue has been in the museum since what, the early 1900s? Since 1911, it was found in 1910, and it arrived here in 1911. The, um, the, the, the Harvard Boston expedition worked with the Egyptian government. They received, they had a, an agreement, a contract with the Egyptian Antiquities Service. This was uh, starting in 1905, and, and uh, the Antiquities Service divided the site of Giza, which was uh, threatened with vandalism and, uh, be, and the, the Antiquity Service um, divided the site of Giza between teams from the United States, Germany, and uh, Italy. And uh, they, we would pay for all of the costs. We would ensure that the material would be documented and um, successfully retrieved. And then the Egyptian, the Egyptian government would divide the, uh, the fines. So um, for those who don't know much about Menkara, um, can you tell us a little bit about him as a pharaoh? 
I wish I could, but, the, <laughs> but there are very few records of the pyramid builders. They're basically known by the pyramids. And then Ra is known better than the others, Kufu and Kafra, because we have his, so many statues of him has survived. But we know next to nothing about their lives. We're not even quite sure how long he ruled for king. The chronology we use in the museum gives him 18 years of rule, but uh, some people say he could have ruled for as few as six years. Some people will give him as many as, as 28 because this was, after all, 2490 BC. And uh, there aren't the, sur the surviving records of the time that list all the kings with the length of their rule. The list that does survive with that information dates from centuries later from the time of the kings called Ramses, and it is very fragmentary and, uh, and, and, and difficult to, to, to interpret. So we, we don't even know that. I see. However, it's interesting because the pyramids are so large and the king does have a posthumous reputation. And the Greek historians, notably Herodotus, repeats a story that he heard. And uh, he was told at the time that uh, kings uh, Khafra and Kephren, who built the larger pyramids, were uh, harsh taskmasters who forced their subjects to build these grandiose monuments. Mankaraz, whose pyramid is still large with a smaller, was a more benevolent monarch, and he was famous for his justice. <laughs> you can kind of see how that how that would form. Like people are looking exactly. at the pyramids, right? They're like, well, you know, the big ones, they, they were real taskmasters, but the little exactly. one, he was nicer, you know. <laughs> he was nicer. He didn't make them work so hard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Although the paradox is, you know, as the temp as the pyramids got smaller, the temples got larger and more attention was devoted to the temples and to the statues that populated those temples. And I use populate, you know, markedly because the statues were inhabited by the spirits of the king. Yeah, yeah. Was that true also of the other ones, uh, the ones that depict the various um, provincial gods, um, you know, that you mentioned were in the same uh, context? Were those also like uh, spirit statues? I would say that all statues were like that. I see. Nothing was done just to look at or nothing was done just to commemorate, like we would put a statue in the public square. I mean, the later kings did that too. And... This leads me back to one of your previous questions about who would have seen the statue. And I started to say that it depended on its location. The uh, fine spot of the pear statue suggests that it was a statue that was found in the recesses of the temple, which would have been an area of restricted access. But the farther to the front of the temple you go, the less restricted access was, and people would have seen those statues more. I see, I see. And in that case, uh, there'd be a good reason for to want to make them as impressive as possible. Is it true that the um, Menkara pyramid is the only one that a, a body was found in? This is interesting too. Yes, you see, the pyramid was restored in the 26th dynasty, and uh, the, um, there was a mummy, and, uh, and, and the mummy was provided with a new coffin that was put into the stone coffin that was original. The new coffin was a later one. And uh, the, I don't know where the body is now, but most people think it was not the original. Uh, so. So not only was it not the original coffin, it, it's not the original body, probably. Right. You know, this is the body and the coffin, which would have been of wood, you know, as opposed to the sarcophagus, which is of stone. And that's the one in the, the you know, that one. That's an interesting story, too, because uh, long before the MFA became involved, there was an earlier explorer by the name of Weiss, B-Y-S-E, who uh, was the first um, modern explorer to make his way, blast his way actually, into the burial chamber. And he attempted to remove the sarcophagus and uh, put it on a boat and uh, to send, to send 
out of Egypt and the boat sank off the coast of Spain and the uh, original sarcophagus of King Menka Ra is still somewhere on the ocean floor. Oh um, man. Well, I hope they find it someday. <laughs> uh, but there was, uh, in the old kingdom, there was no writing on any of the sarcophagi, is that right? In the old kingdom, well, in the fourth dynasty, there was no, there were no inscriptions in the burial chambers of the pyramid and the coffins, the, the sarcophagi were decorated sometimes with, um, sometimes they were plain, but sometimes they had decorations. They had a, a niche to decoration that represents a, a, a palace facade hung with uh, tapestries. And, but the, 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 the chambers were not in, inscribed in the fourth dynasty. At the end of the fifth dynasty, we first get what we call the pyramid texts because there are inscriptions written inside the mm -hmm. burial apartments of the, of the pyramids. Uh, was Menkara's wife, the one who's depicted in the statue, his only wife or That's his good, first wife? Oh, we don't know. And we don't even know. There are people who, 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 who don't even think it's the wife. There are some people who say maybe it's his mother. There are some people who say maybe it's a goddess. You know, this statue, this pear statue was the prototype for hundreds of such statues that were made later on. But this was the first one. Now, in most cases, when you have a couple, it's a man and a wife. So uh, for me, I think this is most likely who it is. But even, even if it was his wife, we don't know which wife. So by the king's pyramid, there are three smaller pyramids that were the subsidiary pyramids that were made for, for three wives. And we don't know their names because nothing inscribed was found in those pyramids that tell us their names. George Reisner, who found the statue, thought he knew who she was. I mean, he'll, the old publication will say King Menkara, or they will say King Mycerinus, as he was referred to then, and Queen Kamera Nebti II, who was a wife of King Menkara, and who bore him a son, whose name was Ku Enra, whose statue was in the Museum of Fine Arts, but who never became king. And she wasn't buried in one of those subsidiary pyramids. She was buried elsewhere in the Giza Cemetery. We know exactly where. But she probably was not his chief queen because she wasn't buried in one of the queen's pyramids next to the king's. Yeah. So this is along with the rest of what I was telling you about how little we really know about the personal <laughs> lives of the greatest builders in Egyptian history. Yeah, and I, I'm wondering if if all of uh, the other two wives who are next to him would have also been the same size as him if they were depicted in statuary or if one was particularly higher than the others. It's be interesting to find out. Well, normally you see one reason why some people would say that uh, the king is shown with the goddess is that you might expect the goddess to be shown the same height as the king, but not a mortal woman. However, the queen, whether it's his mother, the queen, the previous queen, or his own wife, the queen, appears there playing the role of the goddess. So in the role of the goddess, she is shown as high as the king is. Oh, I see. I see. So maybe in a different context, she wouldn't be the same maybe, size. Maybe. Uh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, just it, with, the more questions that you ask, the more questions it raises, you know? Which is what makes it so fascinating and such a rewarding area of study, particularly when we have such beautiful monuments. Yes. I, I do have um, people in my audience who uh, often say things like, well, um, you know, Egyptian, the quality of Egyptian uh, art and architecture goes down after the old kingdom. But you said something earlier before, like, well, they just had a, they had a different, different priorities, like their temples got better or something like that. Is that your, your view of things? I don't think, I think there are certain periods of great prosperity, you know, so when the central government would be able to command greater resources and not only get send out quarrying expeditions or get rare stones or rare wood or gold, you know, or gold they got nearby, lapis, you know, things from other places. This, I think there, there are uh, I, the statuary of, uh, of the Middle Kingdom kings of Simlajvis III and Amenemhat III are beautiful too. The statuary of Amenhotep III is beautiful too. We have, you know, 
sculpture from the very latest periods. And projects are not going back. Uh, well, we, you know, I can't really set a date, you know, but there, there's beautiful work created in, in, in all of the periods when there was the wherewithal to commission, you know, mm -hmm. such works. Oh, and, and, and uh, you had mentioned about the, the, the significance of the pose of um, Mankari and his wife. Is there any other symbolism on the statue that you think is, is noteworthy? The way they're standing or the, whatever they're carrying or what they're wearing? What's noteworthy is that you see some of these things which become standard in Egyptian art for the very first time. You know, particularly in on, on on a large scale. So the format of pear statue, you know, uh, of a, a man and woman standing together continues, but you see it for the first time here. And in the fourth dynasty, it's not necessarily a king and a queen. We have a statue in the collection that is uh, represents two women. It's a uh, two princesses, you know, or a queen and 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 her daughter. So they experiment with that with that format. The costume is the traditional you know, costume of the king. He wears the so-called Mimi's headdress, the headdress with the lappets on the side, which we know from the Great Sphinx, or we know, everybody knows from the Tutankhamun's gold funerary mask. It's, that persists, through, you know, through the ages. So the uh, kilt that the king wears in front, that's, uh, you know, he's bare chested and he wears a kilt and in front there is um, a, um, like an apron, you know, like panel, that's the standard, you know. So it, it, it's, it's, it's significant because it's maybe the first time that you're seeing this on a large scale and it's repeated over and over again. And other than that, there is doubtless symbolism that escapes us because they don't tell you. You have to figure it out. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um... The, 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 the one leg forward, I, I notice, is, is, appears that in the That too, story. that too. Yeah. Thank you for, you know, this becomes the uh, standard, the standard pose for whatever reason. There are various ideas, but the generally male figures have their left foot forward and uh, female figures normally have their legs together, but exceptions can be made for queens and goddesses as uh -huh. uh, you have here. And of course, the, you know, the, the 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 stone figures are represent the, the divine themselves it's yeah yeah understandable that they are portrayed like uh like like gods and goddesses also if you think of egyptian art or egyptian history if it ended with the pyramid age a whole lot of baggage that we assume is characteristic of Egyptian art would just not be there. Not that it's not good, but the statuary of the Pyramid Age is very simple. It's beautifully done and most sensitively carved with great attention you know, to the an, 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 an anatomy. But people are not wearing such fancy things. You know? They're not overloaded with, 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 with elaborate headgear. It's, 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 it's fairly simple and forthright. It's the it's they impressed by their by their presence. Yeah, yeah. They, they don't look like Ramses, you know. You know they they are not wearing all of these piles of headdresses and all of these things and 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 and, and billowing garments, you know, and layers and layers of them. Yeah, so they they got a little bit more uh, fancy later, I guess. They got a little more fancy later, right? <laughs> Tell us a little bit about uh, the 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 collection that you have, the Egyptian collection you have at the Museum of Fine Arts, and and what people uh, can find there besides this particular statue. Well, the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts, the Egyptian collection, is one of the largest Egyptian collections in the world. We have between sixty thousand and seventy thousand objects. I'm including the objects from northern Sudan that the expedition worked at as well, because uh, the uh, Harvard Boston expedition under Reisner excavated in Egypt under this agreement with the Egyptian government at over 20 sites for 40 years. And uh, were mainly known for the work at the pyramids where the expedition had its headquarters for all of those 40 years. Also from our work in Northern Sudan, because um, during certain historical periods, uh, during the Middle Kingdom, 
And in the New Kingdom period, Northern Sudan was an Egyptian colony. And uh, so there are Egyptian works of art that were made there. But of course, most of the work from Nubia, Northern Sudan is Nubian art. So we have an awful lot of that too. So the collections here in Egyptian art of the pyramid age and in Nubian art from Northern Sudan are probably the best outside of their countries of origin. At the museum, we can, you can see works of art from all of the periods. Wait, are you, are you saying that it's even better than what we might find at the Met? For the Old Kingdom and Nubia, yes. Wow. Because, the, because the, the Met also has a great collection that's formed from excavation, but they didn't excavate Old Kingdom sites, they excavated Middle Kingdom and New Kingdom sites. I see. So you're so the place to go of, for the Old Kingdom. I yeah, see. yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, the, we're the place to go for the Pyramid Age. It doesn't mean that we don't have wonderful Middle and New Kingdom collections too. We do, you know, mm -hmm. but the, 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 the area in which that's con our, the concentration of masterpieces that are acknowledged to be the best of its kind is uh, in the old, old, old kingdom you know, period. But that just takes us back to 1905. The Egyptian collection starts in 1872, which is two years after the museum was founded in 1870. And we received uh, a large collection that had been formed by um, uh, a traveler to the Nile Valley you know, uh, in the 1820s and 30s. And uh, we have, uh, and, and that collection was exhibited when the museum opened in 1876. And it was such, uh, so popular that it encouraged the trustees to support further uh, acquisitions. I see, I see. Wow, uh, well, thank you so much for talking with me today, Dr. Berman. Uh, it was great hearing about the statue and hearing about the Egyptian collection there. We really appreciate you taking the time. Details in the depiction of the figures in the statue are interesting. The king's right arm is higher than his left to give the impression that he is pulling it back. This implies a swinging of the arms as if he's walking. That goes along with the fact that he's stepping forward. It's hard to see, but there are faint traces of a tail between his legs, which would have been part of his attire. You may be wondering what he's holding in his hands. That is what the Egyptians called a mechis, which is a short staff, characterized by a nodule approximately halfway down the staff. We think that a mechis originally was a defensive weapon, used along with a mace in the other hand. But by this time, it has taken on a ceremonial connotation, though we don't know exactly what that was. A nimus headdress, like the one the king is wearing, usually comes with a uraeus, a snake, it's strange that it is absent here. Sure, a metal one could have been added, but there's no attachment hole for it. It's also unusual that the king's head is turned slightly to his right, while the woman looks straight ahead. This might be an indication that she is the main subject of the statue. The archaeologist who found the statue identified her as Khamera Nebti II, the wife of Menkare. But would a queen upstage the king like this? This is why some have suggested she might be a goddess, such as Hathor. And yet there are aspects of her that suggest she is a human. On her forehead you can see her own hairline below her wig. Her breasts sag slightly, and her nipples are lower, and her belly is a little more fleshy than what you would expect on a goddess. It suggests a woman who has borne children. For these reasons it has been suggested that she is actually Menkware's mother, Khamerenepti I who is being portrayed as a form of the goddess Hathor. Whoever she may be, this statue is so beautifully made that you will often see it depicted and discussed in art history books. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want to support this channel, you can do so for as little as $2 per month at patreon.com slash world of antiquity. You might like my little e-booklet, Why Ancient History Matters. It's designed to persuade people that the subject is important, even in the modern world. You might also wish to use it to help spread the word. So feel free to share it with someone you know. It's free for anyone who wants it. I've left the link in the description box below the video for you to grab a copy. Catch you later.